Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's hanging in there doing well. I'm going to read today from a book that was published back in 1917. It's called Growth of the Soil by a Norwegian writer named Knut Hamsen. It actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, I was not familiar with this writer until a few months ago when a friend of mine told me about this particular book, and I really fell in love with his writing. So I'm going to read the first couple of pages. <clears throat> that long, long path over the moors and into the forest, who has trodden it? Man, a human being, the first one who came here. There was no path before him. Later, a few animals followed the faint tracks over the heaths and moors and made them clearer. And still later, a few laps began to nose out the path and to use it when they were going from one mountain to another to see to their reindeer. This is how the path through the great common, the no man's land owned by no one, came into being. A man comes walking north. He carries a sack, the first sack, containing provisions for the road and some implements. The man is strong and rough-hewn, with a red iron beard and little scars on face and hands, sights of old wounds. Were they gotten at work or in a fight? Maybe he has been in jail and wants to go into hiding, or perhaps he, he is a philosopher, looking for peace. In any case, here he comes, a human being in the midst of his immense solitude. He walks and walks, in a silence broken by neither bird nor beast. Occasionally he speaks some word or other to himself. O oh Lord, he says, when after crossing the moors he comes upon a nice spot, an open space in the forest, he puts down his sack and starts walking about to examine the lay of the land. After a while he returns, throws the sack on his shoulder and walks on. This goes on all day. He can tell the time of day by the sun, and at nightfall he throws himself on his, on his arm in the heather. After a few hours he walks again. O oh Lord, walks straight north, telling the time by the sun. He snacks on a piece of flatbread and goat cheese, drinking water from a creek, and continues on. This day, too, is spent trekking, for he has to examine so many nice spots in the forest. What is he looking for? For land? For a bit of ground? Maybe he's an emigrant from the, some village. He keeps his eyes open and observes carefully occasionally climbing a hill to have a look around. Now the sun goes down again. He's walking on the western flank of a valley and mixed forest, leafy trees and grassland. Hours go by and it's getting dark, but he hears the low murmur of a stream, and this low murmur cheers him like a living thing. When he gets up on the height, he can see the valley in semi-darkness below and in the south farther out, the sky. He lies down for the night. In the morning, he faces a landscape of woods and pasture land. Going down, he comes upon a green hillside. Far below, he sees a glimpse of the stream and a hare jumping across it. The man nods as if it's just right that the stream is no wider than a jump. A brooding ptarmigan, so I don't know what that is, suddenly flies up at his feet hissing fiercely at him, and the man nods again, meaning there are beasts and birds around just right once more. He walks through blueberry and lingonberry heather, through seven-pointed star flowers and low ferns with a piece of iron. Low ferns. When he stops here and there, he pokes around in the ground with a piece of iron. He finds mold in one place and bog in another, matured by thousands of years of fallen leaves and rotten twigs. The man nods to say that there he will settle down, and indeed he does. He settles down. For two days he continues to roam around in the area, but returns to the hillside in the evening. At night he sleeps on a bed of evergreens. He has come to feel very much at home here, being already the owner of a bed of evergreens under a cliff. The worst part had been to find the place, this no man's place, yet his. Now his days are taken up with work. He started at once to strip bark, birch bark while the sap was still in the trees. Keeping to the more distant woods, he pressed and dried the bark, and when he had a sizable load, he carried it all those miles back to the village and sold it for use in construction. 
and back home to the hillside he carried fresh bags of victuals and tools, flour, pork, a pot, a spade, walking the trail back and forth, carrying and carrying, a born carrier, a barge plowing through the forest, he seemed. In fact, to, to love his calling of much walking and heavy carrying as, as though not having a load on his back was a lazy way of life and nothing for him.